Let's pray together. Our Lord, we are asking and praying that you would indeed speak to us this morning. We need to hear from you. We, we come like those who are hungry, needing to be fed. We come like those who are needy, needing to be cared for. And we're glad, we're so glad that you're not a God who pushes people away. In fact, you say, I exist for those who are needy. And, and we want to say all of us qualify then because we come with all kinds of needs. And we're also grateful that you actually know our needs better than we know it ourselves. So we pray that you would speak to us, meet us, minister to us as you see fit. We belong to you. It's, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I wrote, <clears throat> I was born and raised in Philly. Uh, so actually just a few blocks down from here. And so for me, I primarily know how we do things in Philly or I know how we do things in this country. That's what I'm used to. That's what I'm familiar with. And so when I was growing up and my parents would take me to India, I was so like shell-shocked by how different things were there, how differently they did things there. Like for example, right? When you go to Philly and you go into a clothing store and you want to buy a shirt and it says $20 on it, how much are you paying for that shirt? $20, right? Because unless that shirt is on sale, uh, that price tag is not meant to be sort of like a friendly suggestion or like a, a recommended donation. That's not what it is, right? It's a price tag. You're paying 20 bucks for that shirt. That's not how things work in India, right? Because when you go into a clothing store in India and the shirt says $20 on it, well, that's sort of just like a conversation starter, right? That's how it works. Because then that's when the, the back and forth really begins to start. And you start off by doing this like ridiculous offer. You do something like, $20, I'll give you two, right? <laughs> and then this back and forth begins, and you go until someone kind of either gives in or the buyer does that, you know, whole like pretending I'm walking away, like, okay, I don't want it, Are you hoping that you'll be called back, that sort of thing. That's what happens. That's how things happen in India, even for a shirt. And the thing about negotiating. The reason why it works is because, you see, both parties have something that the other person wants, right? So on one side, you have people with money. And the other side, there's people with goods, like a shirt or potatoes or a car, whatever it might be, they have something that you want. And so both sides have something that's valuable to other people. And that's why negotiating even works. But let me ask you, right? How do you negotiate when only one side actually has something to offer? Or, or how do you negotiate when, in all honesty, you're in no position to ask anything at all from that person? What does that look like? Well, we're about to find out, right? Because the passage that we're looking at this morning feels a lot like a negotiation. Because there's a bunch of back and forth, there's a bunch of how low can you really go kind of feel to this conversation. But in reality, this isn't a negotiation at all. It's far from it. Because you see, in this conversation, only one side actually has anything to offer in the first place. And only one side actually has any true, real power or weight in this conversation. So in all honesty, it's a, it's a bit of a conversation that's a little bit lopsided, right? It's a conversation between God and a mere man. And so, no, this is not a negotiation. Instead, probably a better word to call it would be an intercession. It's an intercession. It's a, it's a prayer. You see, Abraham, who we're going to look at in this passage, is not playing the role of a negotiator. He's actually playing the role of an intercessor. He's asking and pleading with God. Now, here's the, the interesting thing. He's asking and pleading with God, but he's not even asking for his own good. He's actually asking for the good of someone else. And he's not pleading over potatoes or shirts or, or cars. He's actually pleading with God not to wipe out some cities. Cities that in all reality deserve to be wiped out, actually. As you see, we're going to see Abraham pleading on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so this morning... We're only going to consider two thoughts, right? Two primary thoughts. The first one is Sodom the sinner. Sodom the sinner. And then secondly, Abraham the intercessor. That's the idea, okay? Now, as we get started, let me remind you of where we are in the text. We left off in Genesis a few weeks ago, and we left off with Abraham and Sarah, if you remember, having dinner with three people. But it turns out 
these are not just any ordinary people. In fact, they're not people at all. It, it turns out that two of them are angels, and one of them is actually God himself, a theophany, as theologians call it, right? So after an evening of food and, and drink, and frankly, some awkward conversation about whether Sarah laughed at God or not. Remember that? It was a little bit cringy, right? Well, the, after that conversation, the, the men get up to leave, right? The three men get up to leave. So we'll pick it up from there. Look at verse 16. Genesis 18, verse 16, it says this. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Okay, so it says that they leave dinner. And they're beginning this journey. The three men are headed towards Sodom. And it says Abraham walks out with them, sort of to just kind of like see them off. He's not going to take the journey. He's going to see them off. Now, whether you're familiar with the Bible or not, right, uh, chances are you've probably heard of Sodom and Gomorrah before. And whatever you heard, most likely it hasn't been good things. In fact, the names Sodom and Gomorrah have become like synonymous with things like sin and, and hedonism and, and wickedness. It's sort of like what comes to mind when somebody says Vegas, right? When somebody says Vegas, it's not necessarily good things that come to mind, per se. It's not even necessarily things that you can talk about out in the open. That's why what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? That's why it happens that way. Well, this is sort of like Vegas. Now, I know that when we think about a place like Sodom, maybe what immediately comes to mind is like sexual sin. It's probably what comes to mind. Now, for sure... There was all kinds of sexual wickedness that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, you're going to see an example of that next week. You're going to see some really horrible things that are happening in that place. But what we can't miss is actually that Sodom's sin is way more than just sexual in nature. You see, Sodom's sin was, was actually much more pervasive. Their, their depravity actually was what, much more widespread. In fact... Listen to a, how a prophet named Ezekiel describes Sodom. Listen carefully, okay? This is Ezekiel 16. It says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. You hear that? What are they described as? Having pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but they did not aid the poor and the needy. You hear that, when you hear that, it's not what you naturally think of when, when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But Ezekiel names things like pride, like, like they think too highly of themselves, that maybe they've come to resolve that they actually don't really need God, or maybe they've put their beliefs or their own understandings, or their own needs as being the sort of the, the primary thing of their life. They are a prideful people. It's all about them. Or, Ezekiel says, that they have an excess of food, which is, sounds strange. But what he's trying to say is, in other words, they're not a people who were lacking. They had everything that they needed and so much more. Now, hear that, right? Listen, the sin wasn't that they had a lot, right? The sin was actually that they... What they had became the actual God of their lives. You see, it's almost like they worshipped their bellies. They lived to satisfy its cravings and its desires. It, whatever cravings and desires their bodies had, they kind of just tended to it. Or, Ezekiel will say, they had prosperous ease. In other words, they had wealth and success they probably had affluence. They had all the comforts that they could ever have dreamed of, all the comforts that they worked hard, really hard to be able to get. They were living the Sodom dream. But the problem was that their prosperity, it was turning into sort of self-sufficiency. You see, in their minds, they say, I have everything that I want. Like, what in the world do I need God for at this point? I have everything that I want. Why do I need God? In fact, it, it reminds me of a proverb, right? In Proverbs 30, Solomon says this. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Why? Because he says, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? 
And you see, that's exactly Sodom's heart here. They are living a life of such self-sufficiency that their hearts are basically screaming, who is the Lord? I don't need him. So some of our own, what we need to understand is that it isn't just sexual sin that's going on here. It was pride, it was excess and idolatry, it was self-sufficiency, and to top it all off, Ezekiel says this. He says, they had no regard for the poor and for the needy, which we should stop and think, why is he even mentioning that? Because think about it. They had everything and so much more, but they had no regard for the basic needs of other people. Or they had more than what they needed, but they never thought, had no thought of providing for other people. And it's almost like the, the cries of the neglected and the oppressed in Sodom were crying out in judgment against these people. They were crying out. In fact, look at what it says in verse 20 and 21. It says, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, when you read that, do you catch there is a certain word that's being repeated, right? In verse 21, he says, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. Or in verse 22, he says, according to the outcry that has come to me. Do you hear the word that's being repeated? Outcry. You see, that's a very important word for us to understand because it helps us to actually understand the motivation for why God visits Sodom. You see, the, the word outcry here is actually describing the cries of the oppressed, it's describing the cries of people who are victims of cruelty and, and violence and injustice of all kinds. It's almost like, remember in Genesis chapter 4, where it says that the blood of Abel was crying out to God after he was being murdered? Remember that? That's sort of the feel that we're hearing. It's sort of like, hey, God can literally hear every individual cry of those who have been mistreated and abused and victimized in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he hears it, and it's almost like he can't help but respond to it. It's sort of like this, and I wanted to say right off the bat, it's, it's, it's a really weak comparison, but hopefully it makes the point, okay? My wife, Sharon, she always tells me the story over and over again of when she confronted a bully that was messing with her little sister, right? So her sister, Shaman, was in second grade, and Sharon was in eighth grade. And so one day, Shaman comes up to her and tells her with tears flowing down from her eyes that someone had shoved her. There was a, a bully who was, who was messing with her, and that's all that it took, right? And so Sharon and her best friend, Betsy, they found the bully after school, and thing, they were ready to throw, throw it down. I mean, like, literally, Sharon took off her earrings, like that sort of, you know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what they were about to do. Why? Why was she going to do that? Because she heard the cries of someone that she loved, and her natural instinct is to confront the one who caused those tears, right? When you hear that, nobody's thinking, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You know exactly why. Well, let me ask you, if Sharon is that moved by the cries of her loved ones, then how much more moved must God be by the cries that we have? And what he's saying here is, listen, I'm not deaf to the cries of the oppressed. He's saying, I'm not blind to the suffering of those who are hurting. You see, Senator Maro, just as much as God hates sin, he really does hate sin, he also deeply loves those who are oppressed by sin with just as much weight. You see, the scriptures tell us all over the place of God's heart towards those who are marginalized and oppressed. And, and I want you to hear, that's not even just how God is described within the pages of the scriptures. That's what God is still like today. That same God that was moved by the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah is still moved by your tears and my tears. I, I need you to hear that. Because otherwise, this will just be like a... A, a, a moment to sit and hear of a concept that actually doesn't make any sense in my life. What I need you to hear, brother, sister, because I'm, I'm one of your pastors, and so I've, I've had the opportunity to be able to 
to hear and to witness and to see the tears that you have been shedding for all kinds of reasons. You guys have shed tears uh, of abuse, uh, of various kinds, things that never should have been done that were done to you. You guys have t shed tears of, of abandonment, people who should have been in your life that are not there that they decided to leave. Tears of infidelity, people who promised to be with you that did not keep their end of the bargain. T tears of violence, things that were done to you that no person should have to endure. Tears of neglect, people who were supposed to be in your life that never would show up. Tears of all kinds of injustice. Selma wrote, if you have ever shed any of those kinds of tears, would you know that our God is not at all deaf to your cries? He, he's not blind to your tears. No, he is moved, is what the scriptures say. And you see, his natural instinct is to deal with the sins that have caused those tears in your life. For those sins to be rightly judged, But you know what? I want to say that's what makes God's judgment so difficult, right? Because we sort of have this like love-hate relationship when it comes to God's judgment. Because on one hand, we completely want the judgment of certain people or certain circumstances. We understand it. Like we want those who are abusive or terrorists to be judged it's right for us to want that. Everything in us advocates for justice in those kinds of situations. In fact, if we said the opposite, people would say you're being unreasonable. You're being unjust by not wanting justice if we didn't want perpetrators to be punished. But here's the thing, right? The truth is that at times we can be a little bit inconsistent when it comes to judgment because the same justice that we naturally love we can also begin to hate. Because we can convince ourselves that justice, or injustice rather, done to me or to somebody that I love, when there's justice there, that's reasonable. Or, or that's right. But simultaneously, we can begin to question whether injustice or sin done against God should be punished at all. Whether in those cases, is that reasonable at all? Like, we may say things like, that sounds so unloving for God to do that. Or we'll, we'll say, you know, how could a good and loving God punish people? We'll say things like that. And then all of a sudden, we'll go down this trail that makes us think that, you know what, if I were to be honest, a God who is a judgmental God is a God that I can't believe in. No, you know what I need? I need a loving God. I need a loving God. I need a God who doesn't punish. And can I say, if you're sitting here this morning, and that's maybe where you are, that's where you've landed at this point, can I tell you, and I want to say with great humility, please hear that. That's not just like empty flattery. With great humility, I want to tell you, I want to say your thinking is off. You're not seeing things right. Because you see, the truth is, a God who doesn't judge isn't really a God that's worth believing in at all. A God who doesn't judge isn't a God that you should follow at all. In fact, listen to one, what, what one author said. He says this. He says, the God who is truly scary is not the wrathful God of the Bible, but the God who closes his eyes to the evil of this world shrugs his shoulders, and ignores it in the name of love. What kind of love is this? A God who is never angered at sin and who lets evil go by unpunished is not worthy of worship. That's right. And Frank, can I humbly submit to you, if you struggle with God's judgment, well, maybe then your problem isn't with the fact that God judges people. No, maybe your problem is actually that you don't agree with God on what is worthy of judgment. Do you hear that? It's not that you don't have a problem with God judging people. You just don't agree with them that those things are worthy of judgment. In other words, and again, I want to say, can I say this humbly, right? 
you're convinced that you are a better and fairer judge than God himself. Maybe you're sitting here and you're convinced that in all actuality, God is the one who lacks good judgment. That maybe you're convinced, you know, maybe I would never say it out loud, but I think I know better in this situation, in many situations. And deep down, I want to say, if that's true, what can I say? Wasn't that the very description that Ezekiel used for Sodom as well? He said they were prideful. They lived as if they didn't need God. They lived as if their thoughts and their understandings and their needs and their desires were actually greater than what God has said to be true. Friends, out of great love for you, I want to say to you, the last thing you actually want is a God who doesn't judge. Such a God is hardly worth following. In fact, I want to say, if you were God, if you were God, you would judge sin too. You would do it. It's naturally what we do. And so if that's true, maybe what you're bothered by is not that he judges, but that you disagree with him on what is worthy of judgment. And if that is true, can I humbly ask you, is it possible that maybe your judgment is the one that's off? Is it possible that maybe you're the one that's not seeing things clearly? Because if that's true, out of great love for you, I need you to hear this. And please hear this. I need you to hear that there is actually great judgment for those who choose to live apart from God. For those who are convinced that their way is actually much better than his way. There's great judgment. And the worst thing that God can give you is exactly what you think you want. That would be the most unloving thing that he could do for you, is to give you what you have decided is what's best for you. Listen to what Tim, Tim Keller says. He says, what is hell in judgment then? It is God actively giving us up to what we have freely chosen, to go our own way, be our own, the master of our fate, the captain of our soul, to get away from him and his control. It is God banishing us to the regions we have desperately tried to get into all our lives. Hell is where we will receive what we actually chose, either to be with God forever, worshiping him, or without God forever, worshiping ourselves. If the thing you want most is to worship God in the beauty of his holiness, then that is what you will get. If, you, if the thing you want most is, is to be your own master, then the holiness of God will become an agony, and the presence of God a terror you will flee forever. It's true. Friends, can I say to you, is it possible that maybe the heart of Sodom's sin is actually the heart of our own sin as well? We can convince ourselves we don't need him. We can convince ourselves, look at our lives. What could I possibly get for him that I don't have for myself? And if that's true, we too are worthy of judgment. And that should greatly trouble our hearts. And in fact, that's exactly what it did for Abraham. And that's our second and final point. Abraham, the intercessor. You see, God explains what he's about to do, and Abraham hears of it, and he decides he's going to pray. He's going to speak. He's going to intercede on behalf of these people. Look at what it says in verses 22 and 23. It says, <clears throat> so the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So what's happening here? Imagine it with me, right? Imagine Abraham just heard God explain what's about to, go to, what's about to happen for Sodom, right? So he's going to go and visit Sodom. And he says, if things are as bad as the cries say that they are, well, then judgment is coming. And I imagine Abraham hears that, and maybe his, his heart is beating a million miles per hour, and for so many different reasons, right? One, his, his nephew Lot is there. His nephew Lot and their family is there, and he's wondering, like, what's going to happen to them? Or he's thinking, hey, these entire cities, are they going to just be swept away, wiped off the, planet, the face of the planet? Like, what does that look like? Right? So it says in verse 22 that the two men continued towards Sodom, 
But Abraham stood still before the Lord. In fact, in verse 23, it says that he drew near to God. And in fact, commentators say that the language there, drawing near to God, is the same idea as uh, approaching the bench. You guys know what I'm talking about? When, like, sometimes a lawyer will ask a judge, hey, uh, your honor, not hey, your honor, he will say, your honor. <laughs> say, your honor, like, may I approach the bench, right? That's sort of what's happening here. You see, Abraham wants to speak to the judge in private. And so Abraham approaches the bench, and he says this. Look at verse 23, the latter half and on. He says, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Now, what is Abraham asking here? First, I think it's important for us to say what he isn't asking here. Notice, he doesn't say, how can a loving God judge people? He doesn't say that. That's not his question, right? Why? Because Abraham agrees, sin is worthy of judgment. Instead, he says, wouldn't it be unjust for you to sweep away the righteous along with the wicked, to punish, to punish the righteous along with the wicked. Now, when we hear that, when we hear that word righteous, it should immediately cause us to ask, God, what do you mean by, right? I'm sorry, uh, Abraham, what do you mean by righteous, right? Because didn't Jason just tell us during the, the confession part that there's not a, no one who is righteous, not even one, right? So if, if there is no one who is righteous, how is anybody going to find 50 righteous people in Sodom? How is that going to happen? And we would say that's a fair question, right? Now, we can't take a deep dive into it, but here's a quick answer. You see, typically when we think of the word righteous, I think the word that usually comes to mind is probably something like sinless or pure. And so what we essentially mean is that before God, there's no one who stands sort of unaffected or untainted by sin. Everyone. What we heard was because of what Adam did, everyone in this world is born sinful. That's kind of how we are. And again, we don't need much proof. You can look at our children to say, no one taught them to be disobedient. They just knew it, right? And so we're saying that's kind of the posture for all of us. We are born sinful. And so because of that, no one will be ever able to be able to stand before God and say, you know what, God? I deserve to be saved. I've done enough. Interestingly, that's what so many other religions say. That's the hope that they're hoping for. That at the end of the day, they'll be able to present to God, I've done enough. But what the Bible's saying is, no one can say that. Because none of us, we're all sinful. So that's what we understand that. But in the Bible, there's another understanding of that word righteous. It, it's also used to describe people who rightly relate to God. Not sinless people, because none of us are sinless. But they believe him. And, and they follow him. Not even perfectly, right? Right? with all kinds of mess-ups and trip-ups, but their lives are headed towards him. They're living lives that are following him. They are righteous. And so Abraham says here, what if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom? Will you spare the place? Now, I need you to notice that as well. That's really significant. He says, will you spare the place? Will you spare Sodom? He doesn't just say, Will you spare the righteous within Sodom? No, he's, praying, he's saying, will you spare the entire city? Now, you might say, you hear that, and you might say, well, he's just saying that because Lot and his family is there. That's why, right? And I want to say, no doubt. He obviously wants to make sure that Lot is okay. But if that was the purpose, he probably could have just said it a different way. He would say, hey, can you just let Lot and his family get out before you destroy that place? He could have just said that, right? He doesn't do that. He says, for the sake of the righteous, will you spare the entire city? Now, I want you to hear, that's significant. Because you see, don't be mistaken. This is not, these are not friends of Abraham. Right? These are the same people, actually, who kidnapped his nephew, Lot. I mean, he literally had to go to war to be able to get his nephew back. And so these are not his friends. These are his enemies. But here stands Abraham interceding with God, asking God to spare them as well. The question is, why does he do that? I, I can think of two potential reasons. One, to be honest, 
this is what happens when God takes hold of your heart. You know, your heart begins to reflect his. And did you know that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked? He doesn't. And so even though these are Abraham's enemies, he has no desire to see them being destroyed because God doesn't. His God doesn't. And so I want you to hear, this is not natural. This is not what Abraham would naturally feel. Abraham wouldn't naturally have a heart for Sodom. It's not what you and I would naturally have. But when God becomes your God, it's almost like he takes our natural hearts and causes them to start feeling and desiring things that are indeed supernatural. Causes us to desire things for people that we in our natural state would never desire. So maybe that's what's happening. Or maybe the second thing is, remember, lest we forget, this is Abraham the idolater, but God spared him. This is Abraham the liar, but God spared him. This is Abraham the trafficker of his wife, but God spared him. This is Abraham who didn't trust God and decided that he was going to take a new wife, and God spared him. And so maybe Abraham, in considering his own story, he's saying, how could I, who have been shown such mercy, desire anything besides mercy for these people? And so Abraham says, listen, if you find 50 righteous people, will you spare Sodom for 50? And God says in verse 26, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And it's almost like, I don't know if Abraham is sort of like surprised or relieved, like, that worked, like, you know. <laughs> but he begins to demonstrate this, like, humble audacity, I want to call it, right? Because I, I want to say humble because I think Abraham, in fact, knows deep down he has no right to be asking God any of this stuff, right? How does he have the right to ask God? In fact, in verse 27, 27 he says, I am but dust and ashes, he says. How dare I even stand before you and, and approach the bench, what gives me the right to approach the bench, right? And he says that several different times. And so he has this humble audacity. But the thing is, even though he has a great awareness of he has no right to ask any of this, he doesn't hold back from asking anything. In fact, the negotiations begin, right? And so Abraham goes, if I find 50, will you spare the city? And God says, yes. And so Abraham goes, okay, how about, if, how about 45? Will you still spare it? And God says, yes. And then he says, uh, how about 40 or 30 or 20? Or, or he says, okay, okay all right, all right. It's, he says, uh, don't get mad, okay? He says, one last one. How about, it's almost like a children. Like when they say, like when they're trying to like beg for something, they're like, don't get mad, don't get mad. I'm just going to ask, how about 10? And God says, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, for the sake of the 10, I will not destroy it. And you see this interaction, and I don't know about you, but when I first read this, I was kind of thinking to myself, like, Abraham, why did you stop at 10, right? <laughs> like, you were on a roll. You should have just kept going. Like, who knows? You should have asked for five or three or maybe even one. Who knows? Maybe God was in a generous mood, and he would have just been like, yeah, whatever you want, right? He would have done that. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why commentators say he didn't keep on going. Some say, you know what? He didn't get a chance, because if you look at verse 33, actually, it sees, you see uh, God kind of stopping the conversation, and he walks away, right? So maybe he didn't get a chance. Others say, you know what? The truth is, Abraham maybe got too nervous. Maybe he was like, felt like he was pushing his luck a little bit. He got a little frightened, and so he stopped asking. Whatever it was, he didn't ask. But maybe that's not the most important question for us to ask right now. Maybe the most important question for us to consider is, what was Abraham actually asking for? Like, what was the request that Abraham was making in this situation? Samar wrote, if you consider what he's asking, isn't he essentially asking, can the righteousness of a few bring about the rescue of a many? Or maybe, an, to say it another way, can someone else's righteousness Cover the sins of many. I don't know if you hear it, Samar wrote. But it's almost like the, the gospel proclamation that was made in Genesis 3 is now being echoed once again in Genesis chapter 18. 
And so let me ask you, if that is what's happening here, how would God have answered that question? Lord, would you spare the entire city, the entire planet, for the sake of even one righteous person? Could the righteousness of one really save the sins of many? I think God would say, absolutely, if it's the right one. And you see, the story of the scriptures, the entire story of the scriptures, is about the arrival of the right one. His name is Jesus. In fact, li listen to how the scriptures talk about him. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, for our sake, for your sake, don't miss that. For your sake, he made him, that's Jesus, to be sin, though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We gave him our sin, and in exchange, he gave us his righteousness. Or Romans 5.19, it says, For as by the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, right? That's what we just said. His disobedience made the entire world fall. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. You know, some of us, sometimes we want to say, how is that fair? Adam fell, and we're all, we're all caught up in that? But we want to say, how is it also fair that one man was obedient and we get to benefit in that? How does that work? Some of my wrote, is it possible that the righteousness of one could cover the sins of many? And to get that question answered, all we have to do is look at the cross. Listen to how one pastor describes it. He says, how can I know the length and breadth of the Father's love towards a sinful world? Where shall I see it most displayed? I look at the cross of Christ. There I see the God, that God so loved this wicked world that he gave his only begotten son, gave him to suffer and die, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I might sometimes think that God the Father is too high and holy to care for such miserable, corrupt creatures as we are. But I dare not think of it when I look at the cross of Christ. How can I know how much God hates sin? Where shall I see that, that most fully brought out? Shall I turn to the history of the flood and read how sin drowned the world? Should I go to Sodom and Gomorrah and see the sweeping power of God's judgment? No, I can find a clearer proof still. I simply look at the cross of Christ. There I see that sin is so wretched and damnable that nothing but the blood of God's own son can wash it away. My heart, my own heart, sometimes whispers that I am too wicked to be saved. But I know in my better moments, this is all foolish unbelief. I see an answer to my doubts in the blood shed on Calvary. I feel sure that there is a way to heaven for the very vilest of men when I look at the cross. Some of my wrote, could the righteousness of one spare the sins of many? God says, yes, just look at the cross. Look at the cross. So what do we do? Two quick applications, right? If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, one, we're so glad that you're here, right? But would you please hear, would you please hear that God's judgment is real? And not only is it real, it's right. It is just. You see, our sins make us deserving of his judgment. But here's the good news. God is not just a good judge. He's also a good savior. And the safest place for you to be when God's judgment arrives is actually to be standing in Christ, to be standing in him, to hide in him. You know, in fact, Christians, we sing a song called Rock of Ages. And, and the lyrics are literally, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. What is a cleft? It's sort of like a space that's made inside of something in, 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 in a space, like a, in, a, in a rock sort of thing. And so imagine then, if that's true, if, if it's a space made in a rock, in the midst of the crashing waves of God's judgment, how precious would the, the opening in that rock be? When, when the waters are washing over, how important would it be for you to be able to hide in that rock to find your safety in there? Well, Jesus is saying he is the rock of ages. He desires to be your rock, to protect you.
and he invites you to find safety in him. In fact, would you hear that next week we'll actually find out that it will be too late for Sodom. They will actually be wiped away. But as you sit here and you hear my voice this morning, would you hear, this is a mercy of God towards you. He is giving you one more opportunity, even this morning, to say, it's not too late for you. Out of great love for you, he's inviting you to come and to hide in him. In order for you to be spared from the judgment of your sin, he allows his own son to be covered in the wrath of God, to wash it over him, so that you and I don't have to. You see, that's my story, that's so many of our stories, and that genuinely could be your story as well. Not because of anything good that I've done. I know my life. I don't deserve any of this. But he makes it available to you. So come and hide in him. And if you're here this morning and, and you are a Christian, can I just simply ask, who in your life do you need to be interceding for? Maybe who in your life have you sort of written off as a lost cause? Or maybe, if you're to be honest, maybe you don't think they're worthy of salvation at all because of what they've done. Well, I want to say, if you and I maybe are not even interceding for anyone, maybe it's that the mercy that you've been shown has grown dull as, as well in your heart. Maybe you've forgotten what God has done for you. And because that mercy has become so dull in your own heart, you're not desiring it for anybody else. Or maybe the reality of God's judgment feels more like a concept than reality. And because it just feels like a concept than reality, you're not urged, you're not moved to be able to intercede for somebody else so that they wouldn't experience what God has spared you from. Well, whatever it is, this morning I'm, I'm praying to God that he will give us a humble audacity, knowing that we have no right to ask him anything, but he invites us to ask all kinds of things towards him. So, my road, I just want to say, you and I are Sodom and Gomorrah. That's who we are. But God showed us such great mercy that he took people who were worthy of wrath and made them sons and daughters. And if that's true, I want to say to you, how can we not intercede on the behalf of others as well? That they may receive what we have so graciously received from the Lord. So let's pray. And again, I know my own heart. I know I can walk away from this, this, this moment and totally forget to pray. So I want to give you a few moments right now to pray. If you're here this morning and, and you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you there's no reason to wait. Would you even right now, would you pray asking God, can I hide in you? I don't understand all of this. I'm not sure about all. I have so many questions, but I know that I need to hide in you. He loves to answer that prayer. And if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, would you intercede right now on the behalf of somebody that needs to be interceded for? God loves to answer that prayer as well. Would you keep pleading that God would show them mercy? Lord, we thank you that though we truly were worthy of wrath and judgment, you spared us, not because of anything that we have done, but because of the righteousness of your son. Lord, we want to say over and over again, you don't owe us anything. In fact, the only thing that we deserve is judgment. And so our hearts are overwhelmed by the thought that instead of giving us judgment, you placed that judgment of, upon your own beloved son, 
who did nothing wrong. He committed no sins, and yet he was treated like a criminal. And we've known the things that we have done, and yet we're treated like we're righteous. What kind of love is that, Lord? And, and Lord, we ask for forgiveness for living in a way that we have concluded for ourselves that we actually know better than you. And we confess together, our eyes are blurry. We don't see things right. Our hearts are divided. We don't feel things appropriately. And so we pray and we ask God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Don't treat us as our sins deserve. And we're grateful, God, that you had mercy on us. Because you placed on Jesus everything that we deserve. And you gave to us everything that he deserved. So help us to sense that, to love that once again, and so love that that we want other people to experience it as well. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.